Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, January 25th, 2023. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer joins us today. Tony, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Uh, thank you for returning for your regular slot. They're very, I look forward to it, as do so many of our regular uh, viewers. Tony, uh, since we spoke last, the uh, government of the United States continues to uh, pound the uh, Houthis uh, in Yemen. We're up now up to nine attacks. I think it was two attacks at the time we spoke last. The president himself said after about the fifth attack that they're not working, but we're going to keep doing it. So I have a, a couple of questions I want to ask you yeah. about that. Uh, the first of which is, from Biden's perspective, what is the reason for this? And uh, from a realistic perspective, what is likely to be the response to this, either by the Houthis themselves or by other state actors? Well, I think, uh, thank you for having me, Judge. Always great to be here. Um, Biden gets the appearance of progress. That is to say, so much of what he does, and uh, this is across the board, it's all about narrative management, not uh, worrying about facts which are inconvenient to what you want the public to believe. So this is, <clears throat> he had to demonstrate something because obviously when you have 12% of the world shipping cut in half within a, uh, less than a month, which is what happened, which is what, is, what has happened and is, we still haven't felt the full effects of it. Uh, Europe and the British will feel it long before we do. Uh, we will feel the fix effects of of oil being threatened. I think you're going to see some some attacks on shipping uh, ships with uh, petroleum products. So that can't really go on, and you can't ignore it. You can't really say, "Oh, this is just a local issue. It's affecting." Everybody. So it's virtue signaling. This is military virtue signaling. I said uh, on our old friend Ed Henry's show. Ed Henry has a show I was on with him on N2. I said. Uh, the Houthi, well, after the first strike, I said, this is going to mean nothing. The Houthi will be back up and running within 48 hours. It was less than 48. It was 24. Because, Judge, the policy is to not do anything to stop them. It's to make it look like we're doing something to stop them and not succeeding. Uh, the do policy you, is to fail. Do you uh, agree with some of our other colleagues, uh, Colonel uh, McGregor, um, Larry Johnson, Scott Ritter, uh, the the armaments that the Houthis use are mobile. They are. And and we're not even hitting them. They're hiding them. They're moving them. And this is pretty yeah. much consistent with, I shouldn't ask you if you agree, Tony, because it's pretty much consistent yeah. with what you just said. This is yeah. all for looks. It's not for right. the substantial degrading of them. No, no, no. Th to that point, I think there's a pretty good idea. Well, first off, the Pentagon three days ago acknowledged yeah, the hand of the Iranians are behind all of this. Uh, the, the, a female Pentagon spokesman, I don't remember her name, uh, said it on the podium. It's like, yeah, we know this. So if you know that and you're not doing anything to address that, then that, that kind of makes you a co-conspirator. Again, I'm not a neocon. I'm not trying to get us into a war with Iran. With that said, if you're going to make the policy choice to keep American forces engaged in the Middle East, you got to do something to defend them. Do, does anybody not recognize the, the link between lack of recruitment and lack of ability to actually conduct military operations that actually show that we can do something. And the second factor of this judge is, I don't believe for a minute that the Fifth Fleet or Central Command uh, is incapable of defeating the Houthi. That This is not about capacity or capability. This is because the targets that are being uh, selected by the White House, by the way, this isn't even a military thing, this is a political thing, this is like Lyndon, B, you know, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson with rice patty dioramas in the in the Oval Office. This is this is how closely managing they're managing this thing from the from the, the White House. And, and again, it's a it's it's all political. This is something Lloyd Austin should have stood up and said, "I'm not willing to accept this level of political influence when I'm given a military task." And I think that's why. You, we know what they're doing, the, and yeah. the the, cho the choice is to not do anything to actually address. The, 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 the root causes. So. I just want to take a little side question here because you mentioned the Secretary of Defense. He is nominally the Secretary uh, of Defense. What has the fallout been amongst the military, amongst the men and women who wear uniforms uh, and who have boots on the ground, so to speak, not amongst yeah. the hierarchy, 
to his uh, sudden and still unexplained disappearance for a month, for a month. Well, it is what it is, you know, to quote an old spy school assessment of a situation. It is what it is, and, and it's obvious what it is. It, 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 Austin's not in charge. I mean, come on. Who goes away for a month from their job and nobody notices? You know, for several weeks, like, oh, Lloyd Austin, is, is, is something wrong with him? Where's he, where'd he go? By law, Judge, that position, the position of Secretary of Defense, has certain uh, uh, weapon systems uh, that may be related to the movie Oppenheimer attached to it. And uh, uh, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie, you got to go see it. It's a good movie. Anyway, uh, the, the point is, is that by law, by statute, that position has certain authorities relating to maintenance and response and use of nuclear weapons, period. You cannot have those things just kind of meander off in the night and hope that someone can tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, we need you. They're about to have a nuclear exchange. This is this is a serious breach, and the fact and get this, why are we the only ones talking about this? Nobody else is talking about this right now. Yeah. This is all kind of oh, everything's back. It, it is oh, it we, is a little we, spooky that the we saw him. We saw him on a Zoom call. He's fine. What? Yeah, it is spooky, Tony. That the mainstream media is not speaking about it. It's almost as if the CIA or somebody whoever does this sent out the word. Don't talk about Austin. He'll be okay. Leave him alone. So what is he running the Defense Department uh, and being the integral communicator between the president and nuclear codes from his bedroom in his house instead of in the Pentagon where he's got 10,000 people to work for him? So I've been in the National Command, the National Military Command Center. It is, you know, the big board. It, 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 it's not exactly like the movies, but it's kind of like that. And yeah, you've got literally a full spectrum of real-time communications with all manner of operational capability that the Pentagon owns. And remember, we have the most expensive military on the planet. Now, it's not the most effective, as we know, but it's the most expensive. And within that expense, we've spent oodles of money on command and control, which is what you're talking about, is the ability of the Secretary of Defense or someone else to be able to communicate and direct things. Uh, when you're sitting in a hospital, you know, or at your home with a with a laptop in one hand and a bedpan in the other. I don't know. You may get it mixed up and put your hand in the wrong thing. Oh. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think okay. it's a good I idea. Get, because I, I get the picture. I have yeah. not been in that room where you have, but I have been in government rooms like it. Mm -hmm. And there are New York uh, Police Department Command Center. There are yeah. 200, 200 television screens uh you know, on the on the walls of that room it dwarfs fox control rooms and fox control rooms which you and i have both been in are oh, yeah. are, are extensive yeah i got tours so of I them yeah. imagine what this yeah. one is like in the pentagon that he can't use because he's in bed with a laptop right literally all that, right that's how i'm saying this and again the issue was he didn't even go about trying to make sure that that there is a process. There has been a process. Again, I, you know, Judge, we've talked about this. I publicly acknowledge some of the people I've advised, others I have not at that level. And I've worked with people at that level. And you always have a handoff, a warm handoff to someone who's going to be taking over your responsibility. You know, uh, Danny Davis and I spoke about this the other day. Danny and I have both relieved people for less. That is to say that I have had situations of dereliction of duty where somebody did a knucklehead thing like Austin, and I relieved them. I, I fired them, and I fired both military members and civilians. I actually put a civilian on an airplane out of Afghanistan because he was not able to perform his duties. Not his own, not his fault. He had medical issues relating to to um, to diabetes. It's like, dude, you can't be in the desert in 110 degree weather. It's just you know. Right. You're not going to function well, and you can't do your job. It's time right. to go Let, home. Let's get back to the military, it, it, sure. not to uh, the Secretary of uh, Defense. So we have um, military in Yemen, in Syria, and in Iraq. The military in Iraq, who've been asked to leave and ordered to leave by the Iraq government and aren't, it's not their fault, it's a, it's a Joe Biden decision. Yeah. Uh, are being attacked by other people in Iraq, and they are attacking back those people in Iraq. How crazy is this when you consider what we did supposedly to liberate, in air quotes, Iraq 
from Saddam Hussein. And now we're there. They don't want us there and we're fighting them. Well, think about the irony of this. We are spending far more uh, effort, resources, blood and treasure on defending the Iraqis' uh, boundaries and borders than we are our own. And as a matter of fact, as you know, uh, I don't know if you want to go down that path, but, you know, Governor Abbott did a really great, I think, very constitutional letter to Joe Biden saying, F you, I'm going to defend the border. So, you know, I'm, but- I'm uh, I, I don't want to go down that path, but I have to comment. I'm 100 percent with Governor Abbott. If you read the Constitution and nobody wants to do this, it's still the supreme law of the land. Nat- naturalization. Who becomes a citizen is left to the no. feds. Immigration, who comes here, is left to the states. The feds have twisted that around in utter defiance of the Constitution. Governor Abbott is right, and yet he got smacked down by the Supreme Court, not substantively and not permanently, but preliminarily, meaning for that time being until they hear the case uh, the other day. Back to the- well, he's moving uh, forward, and that's my point, is that we are now spending more money and resources in Iraq, where we're not welcome, where we've been told, hey, you, you can leave now. Uh, and yet we're, we're there. And this is where we're endangering forces. Again, I, I'm, I'd i like to believe, you know, I've been in combat. Um, I've served my time. I've been under fire. Uh, we now have men and women who are forward based under fire. And you got to ask why. Why are they there? And I, one of the first things I would do if I were SecDef or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is reevaluate our footprint. What, where are we at? Why are we there? And what are we trying to achieve? Because those three questions, Judge, I can tell you are not being asked at the Pentagon or at the White House. All right. Here's a technical question for you. And I know you know the answer because you worked there. Can the uh, chair of the Joint Chiefs order the military to do anything? Or is he just the senior military advisor to the president of the United States? Latter, but it's complicated. So, yes, technically, he's the brainstem. Basically, anything that has to be done has to go through the, the joint staff. The joint staff, also known as the imperial staff, gives you a hint of how they're looked at. Yeah, uh, They're the ones who have to basically take uh, c- commander's guidance. The commander, you know, the commander being the, the president or the secretary of defense, as we know, and as you and I agree, civilian leadership is the requirement of the Constitution. I think it's a wise choice to not have, you know, uh, military leaders in charge of, of, of the Pentagon. And so the, the chairman of the joint chiefs is the, the the position and staff that translates commander's guidance into operational uh, uh, objectives and executable orders. So basically, the, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I've, I've done this, I've had to do this, I've received chairman of the Joint Chief guidance before and messages, and it you basically have to cite authorities, you have to cite who's involved, there's, there's a number of things that go into it, but ultimately, the chairman it's, himself does not have any authority, he is an advisor, but he is a very powerful advisor by the fact that he's the one that has to issue all the guidance and orders at the Pentagon. Okay. Um, Does uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu want to trap the United States into a war in the Middle East where we provide active support, either Air Force or troops on the ground? I don't think they, the Israelis want us there right now, Judge. I don't. Based on some other things, I've, I i don't want to get into the sources that I have, but there's been a great reluctance to let us, the United States, do anything directly within Israel. And and, and uh, this has, to, I just put it out there, it has to do with hostages. We, you know, we have some several American hostages still left. Um, Special Operations Command, I, I, I I have to be a little bit careful, are leaning forward. I think they wanted to do things. They're, they're, they're not going to be able to do anything. So I think that um, the indications based on what I'm seeing, no, they don't want us there. They're not going to let us in there. I think it's the other way around. I think the Biden administration wants to have a, 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 sufficient, a sufficient pedigree to show that they're a, a wartime uh, administration without having to do what a wartime administration has to do, which is actually think about strategy, think about engagement. Because look at what they say. Look at look at Tony Blinken's. Look at every Tony Blinken speech. Every Tony Blinken speech talks about how successful they are, our engagement, how the world is looking to them. Heck, Judge his Davos speech, he actually used the phrase, "The world wants us to be engaged and help them." I don't think so. 
So no, I think this is more the Biden folks pushing, not yeah, not the not the Israelis. We're going to run a clip in just a minute of Tony Blinken at his worst <laughs> uh, at Davos with Tom Friedman from the New York Times asking uh, questions and bobbleheading agreement to all of uh, uh, Secretary Blinken's. I heard, they, I heard they bunked together, too. Ah, before we get there, um, is the U.S. militarily prepared for a war in the Middle East. Now, we just lost no. two Navy SEALs. They are young men, the cream of the crop. The government right. invested $1 million. You know what this training is like. In order to train oh, yeah. each of them, they drowned to death. One of them was drowning. The other jumped in to save him, uh, and they both died. Uh, yeah. are, are we prepared for this? And for what? Over the Houthis? So we're not prepared for two reasons. First, uh, there's been a... Uh, a mass influx of, I'll just say it, diversity hires. Basically, judge people are being judged by who you sleep with, if you have a mental condition known, known as transgenderism, uh, and if you what skin color you, you have. Those are the prerequisites and distinguishing characteristics that are used to determine if you're competent to lead military operations and grow organizations. It's dangerously bad. I mean, it, it, uh, this is the worst. It, it's always been there a little bit, but now it's really, really bad. So that's the first thing. I think you have an inherent weakness based on the fact that the, the, uh, the, the, the measure of a, of a person, not a man or woman, a measure of a person is based on how many boxes you check within diversity, the DEI issue. So that's, that's, it's, it's going to lead to catastrophic failure that we have not seen before. Secondly, is just militarily to the, 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 the actual resources available. We have depleted all of our services, every service, except for Space Force, but they're kind of still getting on their feet uh, by giving uh, huge amounts of material to the uh, Ukrainians. So we have essentially uh, maybe 30 days, maybe 60, probably 30 days of of uh, ammunition, fuel, and other things that are that would be necessary to go to a near peer conflict. Wow. That is to say, if we decide we're going to go to war, this is what we have because we've not had time to replenish 770, well, 700 days of providing uh, material to the Ukrainians has really depleted it. everything we have. Got it. So it is a fair criticism of the Biden administration to say that our military defenses or offenses where offense is needed in their mind have been materially depleted by yes. what we've done for Ukraine. And I'm going to add this part. I think you agree. Ukraine has been a dismal and absolute and catastrophic failure. I don't think there's any way of hiding it now. Even, even the Institute for the promotion, I mean, the study of war has yeah. actually admitted that, uh, that Jack that, Keen, <laughs> that's Jack Keen, our friend, Jack, right. <laughs> Jack's going to be uh, upset, but that's okay. Yeah, the, 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 they have actually admitted that Avdiyevka, Avdiyevka, boy, I'm terrible with these names. Avdiyevka, it's basically in the Donetsk, Donetsk ish area, is right. about to fall. They're admitting it. And uh, what, but, but the, the reason they're admitting, admitting it is because, hey, we need more money because, uh, you know, the Ukraine's about to fall. Now, think about where we've started and where we've gone to. We've gone to from the beginning of the spring offensive last year. Uh, oh yes, we're going to take back Crimea. It's going to be a walk in the park. Uh, we, you know, Petraeus, Hodges, everybody out there. Oh, this is going to happen. And a few of us, your friends, my friends, like, yeah, it's not going to happen. It's not in the cards. And here we are, you know, coming. We're in the winter. It's been uh, about nine months, ten months, and we're right, and they're wrong. And yet right. now they're saying, oh, we we need more money because if we if you don't give us the money that we said we needed to win. Uh, that we're really going to lose because the Russians are going to be back on the offensive. There's no indication at this point that, that the Russians will go back on the offensive, but they have the option. So I think that's what the situation is. The, the photo we just saw is Patrick Lancaster, an independent American journalist who from time to time reports to us, and he called us before the sun came up on Sunday morning and said an open-air market in downtown Donetsk has just been attacked, and I'm there, and I've counted yeah. 25 dead bodies, and we went live with them. It turned out 27 uh, were dead. What conceivable military purpose is served, Tony, by attacking a civilian open-air market on a Sunday morning? Well, no, that was a terror attack, and I think the Ukrainians did it. 
I think there's all in, all indicators that the Ukrainians did that with with yeah. what you just point out. It's like, yeah, why why wasn't the military target? This Look, is, there's evidence that they they may have taken down that IL seventy six, right? With, uh, with uh, Ukrainian prisoners on it, right? Right. Uh, this is switching to Gaza, but this is uh, Tony Blinken. I think at his worst, Blinken on Gaza, Chris uh, being uh, questioned at uh, Davos by Tom Friedman of the New York Times. Watch this, Tony. One of the things you hear so often from people, given the high civilian casualties in Gaza, is does the United States, do Jewish lives matter more than Palestinian and Muslim lives, and Muslim, Palestinian Christian lives, uh, given the incredible asymmetry uh, in casualties? And I've been asked that. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. No, period. Um, for me, I think for so many of us, um, what we're seeing every single day in Gaza uh, is gut-wrenching. Um, and the suffering we're seeing among innocent men, women, and children breaks my heart. The question is, what is to be done? We've made judgments about how we thought we could be most effective in trying to shape this in ways to get more humanitarian assistance to people, to get better protections and, and, and minimize civilian casualties. Um, and at every step along the way, not only have we impressed upon Israel's responsibilities to do that, um, we've seen some progress in areas where, absent our engagement, I don't believe it would have happened. Mm -hmm. This is the same nonsense. Uh, I feel sorry that people are dying. Oh, but do you need any more 2,000-pound bombs, BB? Because if you do, they'll be there tomorrow. So, look, this is cultural arrogance at the senior level. I've seen this from civilians like, like him. Uh, I've seen this in combat with, uh, uh, with McChrystal. You know, I wrote Operation Dark Heart. We've talked about it before. Right. In, in one of the chapters, we talk about how... Uh, CIA came up with some targeting information saying a warlord was meeting in a madrasa in a school. And uh, we could we DOD couldn't verify. It. I couldn't get a team out there in time. It would take two days. They decided the bomb it anyway, and they killed a bunch of women and children because, you know, people lie to you about what's going on. So th it's that callousness at the senior level. It's like, yeah, what's a few people who aren't Americans? It's, it, it's this arrogance. It's an utter arrogance I've seen at the top. I was actually on a podcast last night with some colleagues who were in Iraq and Afghanistan who saw the same thing as I did. There is no dealing with that level of narcissism and socio, socio, sociopathy. Pathy, pathy. Uh, John Kirby. John Kirby earlier uh, last Sunday on the Sunday show was discussing what we talked about, the issue of having men and women deployed in Iraq, and they were attacked. They, the uh, defenses in one of the air, air, U.S. Air, air bases there was overwhelmed by an Iranian militia, and we had TBI, this, this traumatic brain injury. Oh, no big deal. You know, what's a little brain injury between friends? That's mm. the utter arrogance of, of, of uh, John Kirby, of, of Blinken, of Austin. And Austin, shame on Austin, since I was in combat with Austin. Austin was the brigadier general in charge of Task Force, uh, 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 Combined Joint Task Force 180, who was there. He was decorated in combat. For some, and for someone to him to be allowing this level of callousness either for civilian casualties or military casualties speaks volumes of who these people are they are not human they are they essentially have become uh, animals focused on retention of power and power being that ultimate the, the use of power and maintaining it is the ultimate goal with no regard to how it's used sorry right, you just saw blinken and uh, now we're going to switch to his opposite number you'll see a decidedly different mentality and persona in Russian Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov. I realize we're going back and forth between Gaza and Ukraine, but we're, we're talking about the mindset and preparedness yeah. uh, of government. Uh, here is uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, being interviewed by CBS News on the willingness of uh, the Russians to negotiate an end to Ukraine and the obstinance of the United States. Anybody who is sincerely interested in justice, uh, including justice being established in the relations between Russia and Ukraine, uh, which would involve, of course, stop 
uh, stopping the Western policy of using Ukraine as an instrument of war against Russia, we would be ready to listen. President Putin repeatedly said that it is not true when somebody is saying that Russia is against negotiations. Actually, uh, Anthony Blinken said this in Davos uh, a few days ago. It is not true. Russia was always emphasizing that any serious proposal which would include the discussion of the situation on the ground, of the origin of this situation, and of reaching a solution which would guarantee legitimate national interests of Russia and Ukrainian people, we would be ready to discuss it. Sounds credible to me, Tony. So, yeah, the um, from what I can tell, the Russians never stopped wanting to have negotiations. This is something that um, I think even you and I uh, have talked about, is that early on in the conflict, uh, within the first, I think, 100, 150 days, um, there was an effort to negotiate a settlement. And the British and the United States pushed the Ukrainians away from that. Uh, and I think that I'd like to believe the Ukrainians now are waking up to the fact that they were sold a bill of goods by the U.S. and U.K. I'm laughing. Yes, and I, so I just want to stop you for a minute. I'll tell you why I'm laughing and you'll laugh, too. What you just said is so well grounded and well accepted that there was this agreement, this handshake uh, yeah. in Turkey. We actually had not live. We had a clip from him from the Ukrainian ambassador who was one of the Ukrainian negotiators yet. Two people you and I know have denied the existence of this agreement. Bill O'Reilly and Jack Devine. I don't think you're surprised at either of them and their obstinance. And both said the same thing to me. I don't believe it. How do you know you weren't there? So, well, I'm disappointed more at Bill, but Bill can be very mercurial. Uh, I'm not surprised about Jack because Jack is... Let me ask you a question about Jack. I don't want to get you sideways. Has Jack ever been right about anything he said over the last year and a half, two years? No, but Jack is consistent. Right. <laughs> well, that's a good point. It's, consistency is very important. Uh, yeah, so I, I do appreciate that. So it's it's like uh, being a Whitey Bulger. Man, you, you, you know, you can go a long time, uh, you know, kind of flying under the radar and being consistently, you know, wrong. But anyway, I don't go down that path. But anyway, so the bottom line is to me, there was off ramps all along and the Russians are saying, yeah, we're still open to an off ramp. We're just not going to, we're not going to back down. We've stated our policy objectives. We're sticking to those. And I still find it interesting judge it. I find even uh, now propaganda that's kind of little artifacts of it left over. Oh, Putin wanted to take over all of Ukraine in the first, it's like, no, he's always stated it's a special military operation. Right. And when he, you know, there was some, I think, uh, feints done to make people think he wanted, was going, going to go into Kiev, to distract and pull forces away from where he was going, which it did work, not as well as he'd hoped. But yeah, the, the Russians have been the adult in the room. I'm not pro-Russian. I'm simply stating by what I can see, they've been far more effective and, and uh, clear in what they want to do and willing to talk than what the mainstream media has been willing to portray. You know, uh, Joe Biden and Tony Blinken have said over and over, Putin has lost Putin has lost, and then Biden makes a statement. If Putin takes Ukraine, he's going to go into NATO countries, and that'll produce some American boots on the ground. This is just crazy. It's not based on reality. It's not based on the facts. It's based on politics. Well, think about this. Think about the effort that's gone in just, just to maintain what the Russians have. Do you really think the Russians are going to turn and become mobile and be you know, able to it's like if you just again, it's all about the numbers, Judge. The numbers aren't there. And oh, by the way, yeah, the, the, they're quietly talking about a Ukrainian government in absentia because they think Ukraine may well fall soon. They're, yeah, that's it's what interesting you said about. that. Uh, colonel uh, McGovern, uh, or excuse me, <laughs> Ray would love to be a colonel. Colonel sure. McGregor um, recounted to us yesterday a piece from the uh, Asian Times saying the U.S. government wants Ukraine to move its government out of Kyiv and into Lviv. I don't know where Lviv is, but I assume it is west uh, of Kyiv. Putin has no interest in governing Ukraine, a country None. that hates him. He None. only wants dominion 
over the Russian cultural areas, those parts that have been part of Russia, part of Ukraine, mainly Russia for 300 years, That's and correct. no NATO in, in the rest of Ukraine. That's, That's all correct. we want. The last thing in the world he wants is to take over Kiev and have responsibility for running the country. No, they're, they're trying to whip up fear. I mean, some knucklehead in one of the NATO nations was saying, oh, you need to get supplies in your basement and water just in case we go to war. It's like, please. I mean, talk about fear mongering. It was, it was, it was obvious. Like, no, dude, we're not going to war. These things take time to build up if it's going to happen. And there's no buildup for that. So. Tony Schaefer, always a pleasure, my dear friends. A great conversation, uh, and uh, I'm deeply grateful for it, as are uh, the fans who've been watching and uh, commenting this morning. Right. Well, thank you, Judge. Always great to join you. Oh, thank you. We'll see you again next week, my man. All the best. Yep. Uh, coming up at, at 9 o'clock this morning, Medea Benjamin, the founder of Code Pink and the queen of anti-war protesters in the United States. Medea. Where's the anti-war movement these days? Judge Napolitano for judging freedom. <laughs>